Do you like my teapot? Delightful, isn't it? Bone china. It's a gift from Mr. Silas. The biscuits, too. Shortbread. I haven't seen one of these since... Oh, quite a while. Mr. Sara said I deserved all of this after everything that's been happening. I didn't disagree. The last few months have been a veritable roller coaster. Huh. Listen to me, veritable roller coaster. If one of my students had used a cliche like that, I would have told them to leave the classroom. Uh, yes, yes, I used to be a teacher. Remember those? Probably not. I taught history of art and creative writing. The humanities. I always put the milk in first. It's hard to believe that people used to argue about such things. Milk first, tea first. Old world problems. I made the acquaintance of Mr. Cyrus in circumstances I wouldn't exactly call the best, or even adequate. I'd been looking for a room to rent, and everywhere I'd seen was either full or far too expensive. I'd been forced to sleep on the streets for two nights running. Can you imagine? Me. Luckily, I'd been able to find doorways where the urine had at least dried, and I wasn't robbed or attacked. Not physically. Anyway, but I, I didn't think I could manage a third night. The things I saw, the sheer lack of discipline. Oh, bliss. Pure bliss. The next day, I found myself walking down a street that was clearly... Well, I hesitate to say the arse end of the universe, because one, I am not a lover of foul language, and two, it's another cliché, but, well, it was the arse end of the universe, so what's one to do? My inclination was, needless to say, to flee, but I was exhausted. Well, I could barely saunter, let alone scarper, and my suitcase, small though it was, felt like it contained an anvil, and besides... I just noticed a sign in a downstairs window. Cyrus Lodge. Furnished rooms for rent. I knocked on the door, and as I waited, I noticed a young teenager, a boy, staring at me from the other end of the street outside the corner shop. He was shaking his head at me as if in disbelief or disgust. I assumed it was because of the high quality of my attire. True, it may have been a tad worse for wear, but in a street where everybody wore the ubiquitous monochrome boiler suit, my clothes stood out like... Well, suffice to say, it was tantamount to wearing haute couture in an abattoir. Not that anyone knows what haute couture is anymore. Or an abattoir, come to that. These days, nobody thinks in terms of style, and any living thing can be slaughtered anywhere. The door to Cyrus Lodge was eventually opened by a man about my age, wearing not a boiler suit, I am glad to say, but a striped blazer and a polka dot bow tie. I said, good evening, I'm here about the vacancy. He stared at me as if I had asked him to explain Fermat's last theorem. I said, hello, are you visually impaired in some way? He said, no, no, uh, apologies. I, I do have a slight dulling of vision, but not so much that I can't see you, or anything, for that matter. I just wasn't expecting... Come in! Come in! He opened the door wider, and I stepped inside. To my surprise, the hallway contained a rather grandiose grandfather clock. It had the most fascinating filigree carvings, 
and the loudest ticking mechanism I had ever heard. I must say, I found it rather comforting. The man in the striped blazer introduced himself as Hampton Cyrus. I said, a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Cyrus. He said, would you like to see what room you prefer? I said, I have a choice. He said, all five rooms are free. The room at the top uh, is the quietest and it has a view of the gasworks. How could I refuse? The room was totally and utterly charming. Floral curtains, a china jug, and the old gasworks, overgrown with weeds and vines, did have a certain allure and a Lowry in its Amazonian rainforest sort of a way. Lowry was an artist, long dead, forgotten. Mr. Cyrus said, We used to have the loveliest clientele, smartly dressed, polite, like yourself. I do believe I blushed. And then, of course, everything changed. I said, indeed it did. The whole area became a shithole, almost overnight. Forgive my language. I inclined my head. Our clientele became the scum of the earth. Criminals. They appeared out of nowhere and then disappeared back into nowhere. But he looked around. I've always tried to maintain the standards of the old world. I hope you agree. I said I did agree and inquired about the rent. It was cheap. Cheaper than I'd been quoted. I said, Mr. Cyrus, I don't have much money at the moment, but I hope that you will accept what I do have until I can... Mr. Cyrus interrupted. I will accept it gladly, but merely to cover breakfast and evening meals because there's something I have to tell you before it's too late. I said, what on earth is it? I was all ears. Mr. Cyrus took a deep breath and said, I once secluded an old person in this house. I waited for him to continue. Her name was Miss Scraper. She was my neighbour. When the killing of old people started, she came to me for help. What could I do? They were burning bodies in the street. I hid her in the attic, even though I knew that if my crime was discovered, I'd be flogged in the street. I said, you are a very brave man, Mr. Cyrus. But did no one suspect? He said, they assume Mrs. Graper had been burnt with the others. Mrs. Graper kept very quiet in her hiding place. It was totally secluded. There was a tin bath, a commode. I sneaked food to her on a daily basis. It was perfect. I said, I sent her but them hurtling towards us. He said, but then five days ago, she died. I said, oh dear. He said, I tried to maintain the secret, but the smell. Oh, of course. Of course. But, Mr. Cyrus, please don't tell me you were flogged. He said, I was due to be. And then at the last minute, news came through that they'd introduced blessings. I said, oh, yes. You may keep a person over 70 in your home so long as they get a blessing from the church. He said, exactly. And these blessings would work retroactively, so to speak. I said, how convenient for the church. Corporal punishment may have entertained the masses, but it didn't bring much money into the coffers. So, you paid for this retroactively working blessing and were thus spared a flogging. He said, I did. I was. And everything was fine for two days. I said, what happened? Tell me. Mr. Sardis said, the church introduced you another new thing. If an old person stays in your house without a blessing, then that old person unleashes evil spirits and your house is hexed. I said, hexed? Whatever would they think of next? He said, I'll tell you. The only way to get it unhexed is to get a priest to perform an exorcism. An exorcism? That's right. On the whole house. But I couldn't afford an exorcism, not after paying for the blessing. And so this house, my beloved Cyrus Lodge, remains hexed. And anyone who stays in it for longer than 30 minutes, they're hexed too. But, uh, but I can't get it de-hexed until I can pay for an exorcism. And I can't pay for an exorcism until I get some guests. But I can't get any guests until, oh, you know, because the lodge is hexed. I said, goodness, Mr. Silas, what a pickle. He said, uh, the reason I need you to know this is because if you want to leave, 
I'm hexed. You have... He looked at his wristwatch. Ten minutes left. I said, Mr. Silas, I'm not going anywhere. I must say, sad though this story was, and galling, with regard to the continual, morally bankrupt, money-grabbing behaviour of the church, it did make me feel somewhat less beholden with regard to the next-to-nothing cost of my room. What Mr. Cyrus was proposing was a simple quid pro quo. I got a roof over my head, and he got a respectable-looking guest that might persuade others to overlook the hex. The next morning, after a breakfast best described as Spartan, I said to Mr. Cyrus that if my presence at the lodge was to, hopefully, inspire further bookings, then it was necessary for my presence to be seen in public. Therefore, it was my inclination to visit the corner shop and buy some much-needed victuals. I told him I was more than happy as an act of goodwill to cover the expense of this with what little money I had. Mr. Cyrus thanked me profusely, and said that some extra supplies would most certainly be welcome. He also told me about a neighbour, who had not succumbed to religious superstition, that had been keeping him clandestinely stocked up with the basics. Mr. Cyrus did, however, give me a word of warning. He said, The owner of the corn shop, the one-time Mrs. Blitzer, now self-appointed Lady Blitzer, was not only religious, but a religious fanatic. And for her, a hex was a hex was a hex. I said, Mr. Sars, I have taught hundreds, if not thousands, of stroppy teenagers the correct way to recite blank verse. Believe me, I am not easily daunted. I strolled down the street to the corner shop, or Blitzer's, as the hand-painted sign above the entrance declared, and when I say strolled, I mean it. I wasn't going to allow anyone the satisfaction of seeing even an iota of anxiety, let alone fear, in my demeanour. To quote the Roman statesman Cicero, you are only in control if you seem in control. I heard fully sighted people telling the many blind and partially sighted who I was, namely the newly hexed person at Cyrus Lodge. I was about to enter the shop when I heard an angry yell of Hexa! I was tempted to chant the old rhyme, Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But, as most of them were indeed holding sticks and stones, I decided against it. I entered the shop. There was a candelabrum on the counter, casting a flickering glow across the tins of mush that now passed as food. Nothing sweet, of course, nothing we used to call a treat. The woman behind the counter was wearing a boiler suit and a bowler hat. I said, Lady Blitzer, I presume. Please allow me to introduce myself. My name is... I know all I need to know about you. And aimed a shotgun at me. She went on. How dare you? Walk in here, with your ways and graces, where is you? You, who's living in an ass where someone deliberately kept a disgusting old person. I said, Lady Blitzer, surely you must realise, deep in your heart, that this vile prejudice against old people has no basis in logic or fact. I heard the collective snarl of anger around me. Other people had now entered the shop. A man to my right said, I had two sons. They both died. A woman to my left said, My sister died. She was only 20. And her three children went blind. I said, I am sorry. Of course I am. For all of your loss and heartache. But old people did not cause the virus. That they didn't get it though, did they? Lady Blitzer interrupted. Not one of them. A teenager stepped forward. The boy, who'd been staring at me and shaking his head the day before, then said, I have five brothers. They all went blind and died, didn't they, Mum? Lady Blitz said, They did, Sykesy. And all their dads with them. The teenager, Sykesy, glared at me. 
And what were they doing, the old people, while all this was going on, eh? Laughing at us. They took up the hospital beds. They used up all the medicine. They, I said it wasn't old people's fault that the virus mainly affected the younger. Lady Blitzer cocked the trigger on her gun. Any more of your liberal bullshit and I'll blow your fucking head off. A voice behind me said, Jerry Lover. I said, oh no, please, not the G word. Geriatric, if you must. But a girl rushed forward. She was about 12 years old and wearing one of those fluorescent yellow boiler suits favoured by the young. And shouted at me, fuck off, Jerry Lover. Lady Blitz said, you tell him, Toxie. The girl, she shoved me towards the door. The teenager called out, Good old Toxie. I, I was kicked. I was spat at. I... I'm glad to say I kept my composure on the way back to the lodge, although my pace may have been more of a trot than a stroll. When I finally closed the front door behind me, Mr. Sardis rushed from the kitchen, eager for news. He noticed the lack of shopping, not to mention the flecks of phlegm still clinging to my clothing, and heaved a deep, deep, deep sigh. I said, I am in complete agreement, Mr. Sardis. That evening, the mood lightened considerably, as Mr. Cyrus and I enjoyed a, wait for it, game of chess. Oh, joy. I'd begun to think I was the only person left on the planet who still knew how to play. We sat in the living room, across a rosewood table, bathed in a corona of candlelight, listening to the grandfather clock tick-tock, tick-tock in the hallway. And for a while, the cares of the world just faded away. I was about to take Mr. Cyrus's bishop when a door slammed at the back of the house. I was so startled I dropped my night. Mr. Cyrus said, please don't worry, it's just the neighbour I was telling you about, the one who kept me topped up with basic supplies. The next second, a girl came stomping into the room. She was about 12 years old and wearing one of those fluorescent yellow boiler suits favoured, but I got to my feet. Toxy! I had not informed Mr. Silas of the full extent of my humiliation of Blitzers, so as to spare him any undue distress. Mr. Silas said, Have you two met? I said, This, this gutter snipe was at Blitzers this morning, and she, she, saved your fucking life is what she did. You want to be thanking me for what I've done? It was getting nasty in there. And you want to be thanking me for what I brought you tonight? There's a tin of rice pudding in the kitchen. I forgave her everything. Instantly. We shared the rice pudding between us. And although it may have amounted to no more than five spoonfuls each, to my saccharine starved palate it was a gastronomic feast. But that wasn't the only thing Toxie brought for us that evening. She also brought information. Apparently, the church was now doing temporary exorcisms, a sort of de-hex now, pay later. Seventy days later, in fact. But there was a catch. Wasn't there always with the church? If you failed to pay in full by the seventieth day, the church seizes your house. And if you don't actually own the property, then they have the right to seize it from whoever does. I decided not to launch into another rant about the hypocrisy and greed of organised religion. That would have simply been stating the obvious. I just said, It's risky, Mr. Cyrus. You could lose everything. He said, If I don't get more guests, I could lose everything anyway. And if we do respectable business, 70 days should be enough to get the money needed. He looked at Toxie. Please ask a priest to visit Cyrus Lodge. A 
A couple of days later, there was a hefty thump on the front door. Mr. Saras was changing the linen in the guest rooms. His adherence to routine and hygiene matched my own, so I went to answer it. I found a small woman, wearing black robes, a clerical collar, and clutching a Gladstone bag. She announced, I am Mother Lupin, then marched into the house. A small crowd had formed outside. One of them was Toxie. She gave me a mischievous wink, then yelled, Make the lodge godly again, Mother. Sykesy was standing beside her. He yelled, without a vestige of a wink, mischievous or otherwise, Unhex it for all our Sykes. Mother Lupin turned and said, I will, my children, but I can barely breathe with the stench of the hex. She took a handkerchief from her pocket and placed it over her mouth and nose. I noticed she was wearing a diamond ring. Only a priest could go out wearing one of those and not get mugged within seconds. I closed the door, then followed Mother Lupin into the living room. Mother Lupin placed her Gladstone bag on the rosewood table, turned to me and said, Are you the owner of this hexed hell? I explained I was merely a guest, and she said, Then you are either a heretic or an imbecile. Probably both, by the looks of you. At that moment, Mr. Silas rushed in, still clutching a pillowcase, and introduced himself. Mother Lupin said, Well, let's get started. Contract first. Mother Lupin opened her Gladstone bag, took out a sheet of paper, a bottle of ink, and a quill pen. My heart soared, despite the circumstances, at the resonant, calligraphic utensils. Mother Lupin pointed at a chair and said to Mr. Cyrus, Sit! He sat. Mother Lupin placed the contract in front of him. Name here, address here, sign here, date here. Mr. Cyrus duly named, addressed, signed, and dated. Mother Lupin put the contract back in her bag. Now don't forget... This house is forfeit if you don't pay by noon, noon on the 70th day, plus interest of 50%. I said interest of 50%. We didn't know about this. She said, well, you do now. It's in the contract. Small print. I said, typical. The church has always used every trick in the bloody book to increase its fortune by exploiting the vulnerable and exploiting. How dare you? It's this man here who did the exploiting of his neighbours. By keeping a disgusting old person in this house without it. That's baloney, and you know it. The old are an aberration. It's written clearly in the Bible. Psalm 90, verse 10. The days of our lives are three score and ten. Seventy. That's our allotted time. That psalm was written by Moses, who, according to the Bible, lived to 120. Why didn't he throw himself on the burning bush when his allotted time came? Or had he handily dropped that particular commandment on his way down Mount Sinai? You think that you are so clever, but you're not. The Bible is an emotional truth way beyond your meagre understanding. But I understand it. The people of this street, this whole area, understand it. Seventy years, that's God's law. When my time comes, if I cannot afford a blessing, I would gladly throw myself into the fire. But you won't, will you? Priests will bless each other free of charge. And none of you have ever thrown yourself into the fire when there was no choice but to burn. Mother Lupin stepped closer, staring fixedly into my eyes. Lady Blitzer told me you were trouble. And she was right. She always is. So listen to me, trouble. I will give you a choice. You can either stay be in trouble. In which case... I will have to declare this house impossible to exercise with your hex personages inside. In which case, the people of this street, the honest, unhexed, godly people, will, perhaps not immediately, but soon, very soon, drag you outside and tear you limb from limb. Or, you can tell me you are not trouble. In which case, I will carry out the exorcism and you have a chance of staying alive. And eventually keeping this property. So what's it to be? Are you trouble or are you not trouble? Mr. Silas's eyes were pleading with me, say you're not trouble, say you're not trouble. I said, I, I am not trouble. Mother Lupin said, on your knees and say it. I looked at Mr. Silas, oh, those pleading eyes. I got to my knees, I said, I, 
I am not trouble. Mother Lupin raised her hand. Now kiss my ring. I didn't want to. I really didn't want to. Time for a biscuit, I think. I've always enjoyed dunking a biscuit. Not all did, though. Some thought it a vile habit. Another old world problem? No, not problem. Debate. I stayed in my room whilst the blessing took place, and when it was over and Mother Lupin had gone, Toxie came stomping into the lodge, and moments later she stomped up to my room. She said, unhexed. Mr. Cyrus says I can stay in the attic if I want. I said I'd do one. It beats the gasworks. Who's this? She was looking at a framed photograph I had put on the mantelpiece. I said, oh, that's me and Julia, my husband. Where's it taken? I said, uh, a city called Rome, St. Peter's Square. Julian and I had just met in the Sistine Chapel. What's that? Oh, it's a place of great beauty, great art. I'll show you. I took a postcard from my suitcase. She looked at it. Fuck me, there's a lot of different stuff going on there. <laughs> Indeed there is, Toxie. A lot of bright, joyous stuff, like God creating Adam. Yeah, and a lot of dark, disturbing stuff, like St. Bartholomew displaying his manner of execution. Here, yeah. Jolion used to say the whole thing was bright bits and ugly pits, just like life. He's dead now, right? I said, yes. He died a few weeks ago. I could see Toxie was waiting for me to say more, so I did. When a child's curiosity is ignited, it's our duty to fan that fire. I said, Julian contracted the virus very early, in the first week, in fact. He woke up one morning and he couldn't see properly. Everything appeared dull, like someone had drawn a curtain across the sun, which is how the virus got its nickname, of course. But you will never hear me use it. Never. Well, that nickname is too poetic. Romantic, almost. And there was nothing, nothing poetic or romantic about the virus when it first struck. It was cruel and wicked and vicious and... I took a moment to regain my composure and said, The virus did not kill Julian, but he... He went blind. And for an artist like him, a painter, that's a sort of death. His life became a succession of dark pits, each one deeper than the last. Then two months ago, he went into the deepest of all. I tried to pull him out, uh, how I tried, but Jolion took his own life. And then, uh, and then, as if my anguish wasn't great enough. News came through from the church that any property or piece of land in which a person kills themselves is corrupted and must be taken by the church for deep cleansing. And how long does this deep cleansing take? One hundred years. In other words, they just take your house. 
One morning, two priests and their cohorts came around and told me I had 30 minutes to pack. Just one small suitcase and then I had to leave. And not just the house, but get out of the area altogether. Or else be fined. Or flogged. Or more than likely, both. I watched from a safe distance as they dragged Jolion's paintings and drawings into the middle of the street and set fire to them. All those years of work, all that beauty, the memories. <clears throat> I could say no more to Toxie. I went to the window, I gazed out at the tangle of vines cocooning the gasworks. There was a pale sunset behind. I wondered what Jolion would have made of a vista such as this. And then, Toxie. She's standing beside me, and she's holding my hand. Time to introduce Mr. Tenwan. Goodness, where do I begin? With his arrival. Where else? I always told my students, storytelling is primarily concerned with entrances and exits. It was one week before we were either due to pay for the temporary exorcism, thus making it permanent, or lose the lodge, our home, altogether. Unfortunately, there was no doubt we would lose it. Yes, the temporary exorcism had brought us some business. Two or three guests for four or five nights in weeks seven and eight. But last week, no one. Not so much as an inquiry. Even if we were to rent every room for every night of the final week, the earnings still wouldn't make a dent in what we owed the church. And then. And then. On the day in question, the first day of the final week, I was sitting at a reception desk I had installed in the hallway. It was nothing really, just a side table with a ledger and a handmade sign by me, declaring, Welcome to Cyrus Lodge, when I heard a knocking at the door. I rushed to open it and discovered a mountain. Will, a mountain of a man, a very muscular man-mountain. He indicated the sign in the window. I said, Yes, we have furnished rooms to rent. Please, come in. I opened the door as wide as possible, and he still had to shuffle through sideways and duck his head so as not to hit the pendulum lampshade. But the most astonishing thing about him was not his immense size, but the tattoos. They covered every inch of his visible skin. Face, shaven scalp, neck, hands. Everything was covered in dolphins and pterodactyls and pangolins and old sailing ships and mermaids and tigers, some shimmering with gold. He was a walking, illuminated manuscript. I tried not to stare, but I couldn't help it. I saw out of the corner of my eye Mr. Tenwan smiling at me. I said, forgive me, but I haven't seen such intricate and aesthetically pleasing artwork in quite some time. He unzipped his boiler suit to reveal a tattooed chest and abdomen and would have no doubt revealed more had I not said, let's get you checked in, shall we? He nodded and zipped up. We have a charming room on the first floor. Would Sir like that? He indicated he would. And how long does Sir intend to stay? He held up six fingers. I said, oh. Well, that would be perfect, which of course it was, for reasons he was blissfully unaware. I turned the ledger round and showed him where to sign. He picked up the pen, a biro, uh, not a quill, unfortunately, and with a flourish I found totally endearing, wrote in number 10 and then in number 1. 
I said, well, let me show you to your room, Mr. Tenwan. A little while later, Toxie returned from doing whatever young folk do in this new world, and I told her about the Mute Mountain Mountain. She said, oh, he turned up, did he? Good. It transpired that Toxie had heard that Mr. Tenwan would be in the area and in need of accommodation, and had somehow, I don't know how, I don't want to know, gotten news to Mr. Tenwan that Cyrus Lodge was the place to stay. That dear girl. She was helping us in so many ways. The criminal fraternity guest we'd recently had would never have been so well behaved, nor so willing to pay in full and on time, were it not for her cheerful and clever cajoling. They saw her as one of them, you see. Whereas Mr. Cyrus and I, she was one of us. Family. The next few days following Mr. Temwan's appearance, and oh, what an appearance, were, according to Mr. Cyrus, the happiest the lodge had seen since before the virus. Toxie struck up a friendly rapport with Mr. Temwan. Indeed, we all did. He was the perfect guest, punctual for meals, respectful of the furniture, and fastidiously clean. During the evenings, after we'd eaten, Mr. Tenwan would sit in the living room watching Mr. Cyrus and myself play chess, even though he had made it perfectly clear he couldn't play himself. I think Mr. Tenwan was fascinated by the intricate carvings of the pieces, the queen's ornate crown, the equine teeth of the knight, and was, perhaps, considering them for future tattoos. After all, his epidermis surely told the story of his life in some way, and we were now apart. Of that story. Or at least I hoped we were. <coughs> Mr. Tenwan always carried a small sketchbook with him, and when any of us asked him a question, he would answer with drawings, similar in appearance to ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. Mr. Cyrus and I sometimes took a while to decipher them, but Toxie, oh, she got them at once, instantly. I remember one evening, Toxie asked Mr. Tenwan about his adventures at sea. Mr. Tenwan had been a sailor when he was younger, and he told a story about an island and a mermaid and a great white shark. And he did it all with drawings and facial expressions, and, oh, it was totally captivating. I could have sat there for hours. I did sit there for hours. I asked Mr. Tenwan if I could have one of the drawings to get it framed and hung in my room. Mr. Tenwan became very moved by my request, and I was equally moved when he, oh so gently, tore the drawing from his book and ceremoniously handed it to me as if my admiration had made it the most precious thing in the world. On another evening... Mr. Tenwan indicated he wanted Toxie to share a story about her life. I'd never dared to dig into Toxie's past for fear of what dreadful shudders it might unleash. But Toxie, she didn't hesitate. She said, My dad went blind. My mum's sight just went dull. But my mum died first. My dad went on not dying until he ate a rat not cooked properly, and then he stopped not dying. I went to live with my grand for a while, but then they started killing old people. So my grand came to live here in the attic, and... Here? You mean your grandmother was Mrs. Graper? Toxie nodded. I looked at Mrs. Cyrus. Why on earth didn't you tell me? Toxie said, Ah, oh, don't blame him. I told him not to tell you. I didn't know if I could trust you at first. But I do now. I should have told you. Sorry. And she came over and put her arms around me. Ugh. That poor child, to have endured so much, 
so young. On the last night of Mr. Tem One's stay, an inevitable melancholy settled on the lodge. Not just because we would be saying farewell to our new friend, and friend he was to all of us, but because, of course, tomorrow would also herald the end of our temporary exorcism, and we would have to... to... Neither Mr. Cyrus nor I could allow our minds to wander into that impending abyss. Toxie had been out most of the day. I assumed because the melancholic atmosphere was getting to her, though she'd never admitted. But she returned at nine o'clock and said, Tangerines! She duly placed five of them on the table. I said, Toxie, my dear, how on earth did you get your hands on those? She said, you know better than to ask questions like that. She gave me that cheeky grin of hers. I couldn't help but laugh, nor could Mrs. Cyrus. Even Mr. Tenwan chuckled. Toxie was quite determined who should have what tangerine. Uh, mine was the neatest looking. I took that as a compliment. Mr. Cyrus's had a small blemish on it that resembled his bow tie. We all found that most amusing. Mr. Tenwan, needless to say, had the largest. And Toxie, she gave herself the smallest. Such is the generosity and sense of self-sacrifice of the girl. I could not have been prouder of her if she had been my own child. We ate our tangerines, savouring every citrus drop. Mr. Temwan held up every segment of the fruit to the light, gazing at it as if it were an amber dew before putting it in his mouth. How we all chuckled. Once tangerines were consumed and hands washed, I deplore sticky fingers, Mr. Cyrus and I settled down to our game of chess. Mr. Temwan watched in his usual fashion, and Toxie, she watched too. This was a first. Obviously, the uniqueness of the evening was having a profound effect on her. Mr. Saras and I were only about six or seven moves into our game, perhaps not even that, when Mr. Temwan's stomach made a very loud and very strange gurgling sound. We all assumed it was indigestion. Clearly, Mr. Temwan thought the same, as he gave an embarrassed grin. We all smiled back. Mr. Cyrus was about to make his next move, when Mr. Temwan's on his feet. The gurgling has returned, but this time much louder. Mr. Temwan is swaying from side to side. I cried, Mr. Temwan, what's wrong? He's clutching at his throat now, white foam on his lips. We all jump up. Mr. Temwan starts trembling, no, shaking all over. We approach Mr. Temwan, then stop. He's swaying so much. If he falls on one of us, we'll most surely be crushed. We watch as the gurgling and foaming and swaying continues. Oh, the swaying. He was like waiting for a tree to fall and then crash. Mr. Temwan falls into the rosewood table. It splinters beneath him. Chess pieces and wood splinters ricochet in all directions. Mr. Temwan is gurgling and quivering and then silence. Mr. Temwan is not moving. None of us are moving. It's Toxie who rushes into action first. She says, oh no, he told me he had a bad heart. She feels his neck. She gasps. He's, he's dead. 
She starts weeping. I say, come here, child. She rushes over and I wrap my arms around her. I don't know how long we stood there. The reality of the situation descending upon us like a, a shroud. An apt simile. It was Toxie who gave voice to our fears. You know what they'll say? Lady Blitzer, Sarxie, everyone. They'll say the hex was so strong it came back a day early. They'll say if the lodge can't be de-hexed then nor can we. You know what that means? Indeed we did. We all did. The mob would kill us. And then, and then Toxie said, I've got an idea. Mr. Cyrus and I looked at her. Toxie continued, there's loads of people I know who collect tattoos on their own skin and they collect them on other skin. I said, other skin, what on earth do you mean? She said, they collect the tattoo skin of other people. I was conscious of the grandfather clock ticking in the hallway. Toxie went on. These people I know would pay a fortune for Mr. Tamwan's tattoos. There'd be enough money to cover the temporary exorcism and make it a permanent one. And still have lots left over. Hell of a lot. Tick tock. Tick tock. I heard Mrs. Sada say, so these people, they come here and collect the body. I said, Mr. Sada. He said, I I'm curious. That's all. Toxie said, no, they wouldn't collect it. We'd have to take what they want, and only what they want, to them. Tick tock. Tick tock. Mr. Sada said, So you mean we'd have to? Toxie said, Skinny me up. I'll take the skin to them, then we'd have to chop up what's left of the body and dispose of it, or hard it till we can. Tick tock. Tick tock. Mr. Sada said, But is there time for us to? I said, You can't be serious. What's being suggested is an abomination. He said, what choice is there? Do you want us all to die? Do you? Because that's what will surely happen if we don't. And you know it. Toxie said, there's time. If we all work together, I can do a lot of the simple cutting. By luck, I have some special knives in the attic. But I need two adults to pull the skin off. If we start now, the three of us, we can have it done by sunrise. I can get the skin to the buyers by nine. You can clean up here in the meantime. I'll be back here by 11 with the money. Mother Lupin won't be here until 12. Toxie and Mr. Silas looked at each other and then at me. Toxie said, well? I thought... I thought about gazing up at the Sistine Chapel and stepping back into someone. A man. And we laughed. And we started talking. And we laughed and talked for the rest of that day. And the day after. We, that man and me, Jolion, we decided to travel together. No, not decided. It just happened. We had our first kiss after seeing the Giotto frescoes in Padua. We made love after seeing Da Vinci's The Last Supper in Milan. We said we loved each other after seeing Veronese's Nozze di Cana in Paris. And all the time, Jolion was painting and doing watercolours. He was an amazing artist. By the time we got home, we both took it for granted that we'd move in together. And we did. I was teaching in a school nearby. I wasn't paid a fortune, but it was enough so that Jolion could concentrate on his art. I wanted to do that for him. There was an old shed in the garden that he turned into a studio. It was always a thrill to come home and see what he'd been working on. Jolion started to sell, not much at first, but oh, it took off. He was earning more than me. We bought another house. I got another teaching job. The local newspaper interviewed Jolion. A gallery owner asked to see his work. They promised him a show the following year. This was what I wanted. What we both wanted more than anything. 
And then one week before the private view of Jolion's paintings, he called the show Bright Bits and Ugly Pits. We were watching the news on the television and there was a report about three children in the same family who went blind overnight. And the next day, a report about how they'd all died and yet more children had gone blind. Hundreds of them. And the next day, thousands of people have gone blind. And half of them dying. And then tens of thousands. And then... After we paid Mother Lupin and the blessing became permanent, there was still, as Toxie had predicted, lots and lots of money left over. I was surprised by how much. We all were. It was Toxie who suggested that we make a gesture of gratitude and atonement and give Mother Lupin a gift. Some extra money just for her. Again, as in so many things, Toxie's judgment was spot on. Mother Lupin's attitude towards Mr. Cyrus and I, toward the lodge in general, changed overnight. She became our most fervent advocate. Indeed, we've had her round for dinner a couple of times already. She really is the most pleasant company, so long as you ignore every opinion she has about everything. And listen to this. Our little Toxie has got a boyfriend. Guess who? Sykesy, Lady Blitz's son. The young fellows around here most evenings. Mr. Cyrus and I listen to them laughing and chattering away in the attic. They really are quite sweet together. I did give Toxie a little parental talk, though. Toxie, my dear, you and Sykesy are still very young. So it's only hand-holding and occasionally, perhaps, an affectionate kiss on the cheek. But nothing more, you understand? She said, I do understand. Thank you. Can you believe that? So polite. So mature. Again, my heart bursts with pride. Naturally, I have often thought of Mr. Tenwan and how fortunate we were to have him in our lives, if only for a short while. As I was saying to Toxie only yesterday, uh, how I miss that man's charm. And oh, uh, his storytelling, the way he told those stories. I still treasure that friend drawing in my room. Toxie said she missed him too, and I said, I know you do, my dear. The two of you had become such Close friends. That delicious tangerine you gave him. The largest one. How grateful he was. Do you remember how he held up each segment to the light? <laughs> and of course it was your efforts that persuaded him to stay here in the first place. Wouldn't it be nice to have someone like Mr. Temwan stay here again? Wouldn't you enjoy that? I would. Not every week, of course, but perhaps every few months. It would certainly help keep the atmosphere buoyant. 
Toxie said that she understood everything I was saying and was sure it would happen. It thrilled me to hear her sounding so confident. And I'm sure it's the right thing to do. As Cicero said, if something is proved to be beneficial once, then it should be encouraged to be beneficial again. Or was that Maximus Aurelius who said that? What does it matter now? What did it ever matter? <laughs>